Warm greetings to you one and all. My name's Joel Carpenter, and I direct the Nagel Institute for the Study of World Christianity here at Calvin College. And on behalf of the Conference Planning Committee, I want to express delight in seeing you all here on such short notice. Um, I hope you're having a good time, and uh, um, I appreciate uh, uh, your t taking the time out to, to come here and to share your thoughts. Um, and uh, on behalf of a couple of our, our sponsors, I want to say I particularly hope you take advantage of the book displays um, that uh, both uh, uh, Erdman's and Baker so gra graciously offered out in the lobby. So uh, as you talk with each other, uh, please uh, do linger over the books as well. You might see something that you just can't uh, be without. So. Um, it's my pleasure and my honor this morning to introduce our plenary speaker, Professor Emmanuel Katangali. He's a leading voice among African theologians today in uh, putting a Christian social imagination to work on, um, in the public lives of African people. Professor Katangali works at the University of Notre Dame, our institutional friend and neighbor just down the road. He's a professor of theology and a core faculty member at Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. He works there after years of service at Duke University Divinity School, where he founded its Center for Reconciliation. Professor Katangli comes from Uganda, and he's written much about Christians' role in witnessing for justice, peace, and reconciliation in the conflict-torn regions of East Central Africa. He's the author of at least nine works in this field with two books appearing just this past year, Born of Lament on the Theology and Politics of Hope in Africa, that's an Erdman's title, and The Journey of Reconciliation, Groaning for a New Creation in Africa, that's an Orbis book. Currently, Professor Katangli is collaborating with a research team organized at Notre Dame on contending modernities which engages Catholic, Muslim, and secular forces at work in our world today. It's been a real blessing for me to get to know Father Emmanuel. He's a joy joyful servant of the Lord. He's a deep, re refreshing, refreshing man who lights up any room he enters. And he serves on the board of the Theological Book Network here in town. So he's no stranger to Grand Rapids. So please give a hearty welcome to this morning's speaker, Professor Emmanuel Katangali. Thank you, Joy, for the warm and beautiful um, and very generous introduction this morning. Uh, thank you, Jordan, for the invitation and for all the preparation committee that have invited me to be here. It is really indeed a joy and a delight for me to be here this morning to speak at this conference. I was in uh, Eastern Africa, Uganda, when the invitation came. And uh, Jordan must have gotten uh, an out of reply, automatic out of reply from my email that I'm not available, that I'm not actually even accessing email. And so there was little chance that I would even uh, respond to this invitation. But when I got an, an opportunity to look at my email in Uganda, the internet connection is very intermittent and very uh, slow and poor. Uh, and then I saw it was coming from Calvin College. I had to pause and say, hmm, this is interesting. <laughs> Honestly, the more I thought about it, the more I realized I cannot turn down this invitation. For I have not been at Calvin College to speak. I have been at the Center for World Christianity, but I haven't been on campus here. So the more I thought about the invitation, the more I was haunted. And the more I said, hey, you know what? I need to cut short my time in Africa. Now, that is a sacrifice <laughs> to, <laughs> to cut down my time in Africa to come back so that I can be at this conference. So it is indeed with great joy and honor for me uh, to be here to speak on African theology as public theology. And really, my uh, presentation kind of uh, titled, How Long, O oh God? the cry of theology in Africa. 
For what I wanted to do are three things. One, first of all, is to affirm. Uh, when I, I saw that it was a Kuyopa conference, Abraham Kuyopa's insight, and I started reading a little bit around uh, him and about him, I was really struck by the way in which, for him, all enterprises, in a way, are connected to the movement of God. Uh, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign, does not cry, mine. Everything is mine. That's a, a, prof a very simple but a very profound statement by Ibrahim Koyapa. But I have also come to believe that all theology is a theology of hope. The theologian's task, in my opinion, is to respond to the invitation by Peter in the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 3, verse 15, always be willing to give an account of the hope that is in you. The theologian's task is to give an account of hope. This means that all theology is a theology of hope, but this means also that all theology is public theology. Number three, the other conviction is that Africa is the most exciting place to be doing theology at this time. Why? Because it has both God and suffering going on at the same time. Now, this is the stuff out of which theology is made. Having God and suffering at the same time. Africa sits at the intersection of what seems to be two contradictory movements of history. On the one hand, as many missiologists have noted, the center of Christianity has shifted southward, and Africa is the new center of gravity of that shift. Missiologists have written about the future of the church in Africa. And many have noted the growth of Christianity in Africa, the dynamism of Christianity in Africa, uh, the incredible innovativeness and resourcefulness around Christian faith. Christianity is growing, continues to grow, but also the dynamism, the richness of Christian expression in Africa. That is on one hand. On the other hand, the continent continues to experience unimaginable realities of war, of poverty, of displacement, of corruption, ecological degradation, and other realities. So on one hand, Africa seems to be a continent of hope when you think about it from a Christian point of view. On the other hand, it seems to be a continent of despair. Now, this is the context of theology. God on one hand, and human suffering on the other. Bringing these two together, I contend, is the task of the theologian. The theologian, in a way, is the one who is able to stand within the contradiction, if you like, and attend to the cries that emerge out of these uh, painful pangs of Africa's history and try to trace the presence of God, to try to trace the voice of God within those Christ. So what I want to do this morning are three things. One, and I want to speak very briefly so that we can leave room for interaction. But I want to do three things. One, speak very briefly about the context uh, of theology in Africa. Two, speak about the critical direction, because out of this context arises both a critical but also a constructive uh, direction. And three, a constructive direction as well. That's what I want to do. Uh, and I, this is kind of in terms of one, is lament, the context, two, in terms of the prophetic task of denouncing, and three, is in terms of the prophetic task of announcing. But first of all, the context. In Born from Lament, my previous book that Joy has mentioned, I did a lot of research in Eastern Congo and Northern Uganda and different places. One of the things that was striking for me are these deep cries of lament 
So I collected the, uh, poems and songs of lament that emerge from day-to-day -day experience of the people as they find themselves mm -hmm. within displacement, uh, for example, in Congo over these so many years known as the Congo Wars. One of the poems that struck me was a poem by this young Congolese um, um, Christian, uh, Joel Barak. He writes out of the very personal experience and the community experience, he writes this poem which he entitles Misfortune, Malo in French. See the ashes of your father burnt alive this morning at 6 a.m. as the sun rises, lighting up the village in the sight of everyone. Look at the entrails of your mother cut into pieces by machete after being raped by the militias at 12 p.m when the sun reached its zenith. Behold the debris of your little brother, poor baby crushed with force by his sister at 3 p.m. as the sun were burning in the extremity of the village horrified by these demons. Here are the clothes of your suicidal brother who they forced to watch to the rape of his mother at 4.30 p.m. At that time when the sunlight was still shining on all our villages terrorized in the sight of all. Look at the path traversed by your sisters under the deathly threat of the cursed ones at 6 p.m. when the distant sun rays still shine on the baggage they carried by force. Understand that in the next nine months your sisters will come back to the village all pregnant to give birth to children who will not know their fathers, and yet who will be our future leaders. Oh, misfortune. I begin by drawing attention to this poem by Joe Barak, Misfortune, because it serves well as a metaphor for the many cries of lament arising out of so many Africa's countries, Congo, Burundi, South Sudan, Northern Uganda, Central African Republic, where uh, the plight of the people is so immense. This is the context and the starting point of theological reflection in Africa. Now, if you realize that this is a starting point, it will involve three elements. Realizing this as a starting point, three implications for theology as public theology. One, that public, uh, African theology is prophetic theology. Two, that the notion of a suffering God is at the center of Africa's theology. And three, that African theology is a form of political theology. Let me briefly say something about each of these implications. First of all, theology as a public, uh, as a prophetic theology. And this is where African theology really uh, stands in the tradition of Old Testament prophets. The prophets in the Old Testament, yes, they announce, they denounce, but they also lament. And here one immediately thinks about the parallels between, for example, the poem that I've just read and the prophetic announcements of Jeremiah, the wailing prophet. For during the more than 40 years of his ministry, Jeremiah not only constantly reminded the people of their covenant obligations, inviting the people to reform their ways to be true to the covenant, also denouncing the, um, their, their sins. But at one point, Jeremiah is ordered to stop praying for the people and instead mourn, instead lament. Cut off your hair and cast it away. Raise a lamentation on the bare heights. So if you begin with the starting point of lament, that means that one of the tasks of African theology is to gather laments. Secondly, the notion of a suffering God. For interwoven, if you think again about uh, Jeremiah, interwoven with Jeremiah's pronouncements about the coming destruction is a series of personal laments. What is significant, actually, about what uh, the biblical uh, commentators call the confessions of Jeremiah is that in the midst of uh, Jeremiah's lament, God himself breaks in and expresses God's own grief 
over the sins of the people. Such that at certain times, it is not possible to tell who is lamenting. Jeremiah or God. Like for example, in chapter 14, verse 14. Let my eyes run down the tears night and day, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. Is that Jeremiah? Or is that God? Now, this has very huge implications uh, for theology, especially uh, African theology. That means that the notion of a wailing God, a suffering God, needs to play a far more decisive role within African theology than it has played until now. For a poem like Joel Barak's poem, is not, an, not only a lament of Joel Barak, it's not only a lament of the community, it is also God's own cry. The third implication that African theology is a form of political theology, which is to say it's a form of advocacy. The notion of a suffering God for some people seems to be a disempowering notion, but that is not the case. For as David Tracy notes, God's suffering drives the Christian not to further theological speculation or despair, but to the cross and to the memory of suffering and the struggle by, for, with and on behalf of those who are crying, the marginalized in history. What this means is that the starting point of lament, in a way, pushes theology into not abstract theological thinking, but into theological engagement with and on behalf of those crucified peoples, according to Segundo of Africa. This is what makes African theology really public theology. So that's the context, the three implications. Let me briefly also speak about now. If that is a context, that the context is lament, kind of meaning that theology is uh, prophetic theology, the suffering God is at the center of that theology, and that it is also a political theology, then what are the directions of that theology? There are two directions. There is a critical direction and also a constructive direction. A critical direction is in a way kind of being true to the prophetic call to denounce. This is theology as critique. If you focus on this critical direction, I see three priority areas for theology in Africa today. Again, Jeremiah here provides a good point of re uh, reference. For Jeremiah's uh, prophetic denunciation, was directed especially to three areas of public life. The first one was the political and economic area. Jeremiah really criticized the political and uh, economic life of his time, especially the institutions of public life, which were built on lies and greed. In, for example, chapter 9, verse 3 to 5, he writes, For every brother is a deceiver, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer, Everyone deceives his neighbor, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves committing iniquity. And then when he turns to the leaders, those who have grown powerful and rich and fat and sleek on the backs of the people, of the poor people who are oppressed. They know no bounds in deeds of evil. They judge not with justice the cause of their fatherless, uh, the cause of the fatherless to make it prosper, and they do not defend the rights of the needy. The parallels of what Jeremiah is speaking about with African politics and economics are so eminently obvious, pointing the need to critique the political cultures of impunity and violence and greed um, in Africa. Political cultures that are built on the, exploita the exploitation and the backs of the poor. But they also point to the need of, uh, to critique the ways in which politics, especially in Africa, keeps manufacturing uh, notions like ethnicity and tribalism, kind of keeps tribalizing, if you like, ethnicizing uh, the political struggles, making ethnicity and tribalism uh, an ever 
uh, ending source of conflict uh, in Africa. I'm speaking just kind of briefly, kind of just pointing out, so I'm not uh, dwelling uh, much, much, but we can raise uh, questions and we can have a conversation of that. But I think that is the first area of critique, the political and economic cultures of modern Africa. The second area, again, if we take uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah's harshest criticisms, in fact, are directed to the religious leaders. These are the ones who should know better, who should expose the unjust and evil structures of the society. Instead, Jeremiah notes, the prophets have become wind, and the word is not in them. They prophesy falsely, participating in the same wicked ways and offer consolations and empty promises of peace, saying peace, peace, where there is no peace, thereby treating the wounds of my people lightly. The implications for African theology are immense, pointing to the need to critique, set of critique, to critique the church in some of the ways in which, for example, the growing neo-Pentecostal charismatic expressions of the prosperity gospel that promise miraculous deliverance and quick prosperity, thus dealing lightly with the wounds of the poor and the powerless, saying peace, economics, flourishing, success, when there is no success, but this sort of critique, the critique of religious institution, the critique of the church, also points to the critique of the readiness with which Christianity itself does and can easily become the source of terror and violence in Africa. I've just gotten back from uh, two weeks of research in the Central African Republic one of the poorest countries uh, 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 in Africa, but also one of the richest countries actually in Africa. Gold, diamonds, wool, timber, and so forth. But in 2013, uh, in the Central African Republic, a marginalized group from the northeastern part of uh, the Central African Republic made its way and waged war and toppled the government in uh, uh, Bangui and installed a Muslim president. And the militias uh, began terrorizing people around the capital and in the countryside for money really extorting and anything. Um, but because most of the fighters were Muslims, the Christian population formed themselves into Christian militias, the anti-Barak, that now took out the revenge against the Muslims, killing the, na the neighbors, driving out to uh, the, uh, the neighbors from their villages and sending them into exile. In doing research in the Central African, I was amazed uh, with we, by, 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 by the fact in which a lot of, in a way, self-avowed Christians didn't see any wrong in taking up the means of violence to turn against their Muslim brothers, especially those that they had lived close by, because well, it was our turn also to eat. So anyway, this is kind of pointing to the need, ongoing need for a self-critique, for the religious uh, uh, critique. The third area of, uh, in a way, priority area is the ecological critique. Again, if we take Jeremiah, for Jeremiah knows that the overall effect of the deteriorating political, religious economy of his time, it had led to the worst ecological crisis. Jeremiah's tears, therefore, are, as it were, an instrument of Yahweh's own tears on the destruction on the earth. For example, in chapter 4, verse 23 and 26, he writes, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was without form and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and behold, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and behold, there was no man, and all the birds of the air had fled, I looked, and behold, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruins before the Lord, before the Lord's fierce anger. 
has a very deep uh, ecological critique uh, by Jeremiah, showing that the economic, political, and religious, in a way, decay eventually is connected to the ecological decay. So in terms of the implications for African theology, this is very, very significant, especially given the huge and the growing ecological uh, disaster and degradation in Africa's um, countryside and cities. That means which we, we need to do is to take uh, the call by Pope Francis in Laudato Si as a key text in thinking about uh, the future of theology in Africa from this ecological angle. For among other things, what Pope Francis does in Laudato Si is to make an explicit connection between the cry of the poor and the cry of the earth. These are not two cries. It is the same cry, Pope Francis notes, that arises out of our inability uh, in a way to attend to a deep spirituality of our belonging to God, to one another, and to the land. But also the, criti the critique means you know, taking time in a way to point to the huge uh, areas of deforestation, the growing slums, the, um, the food insecurity in many parts of Africa that is connected to the ecological crisis. Anyway, that is in terms of the critical direction. Three priority areas, the political economic sphere, and two, the religious sphere, the self-critic, and three, the ecological uh, critique. What about in terms of the constructive direction? Because the prophet's task is also to announce. The prophet's task is not only to critique, but to announce. In fact, again, if we take the prayer of Jeremiah, it is interesting to see how Jeremiah um, uh, introduces or is introduced when God appoints him, appoints him not only uh, to uproot and tear down, to destroy, but also to build and to plant. And therefore, that's why you have big sections of Jeremiah, especially from chapter 31 onwards, that are called the Consolations of Jeremiah where Jeremiah speaks words to those who have survived the destruction and predicts, in a way, the return of the exiles with promises of healing and visions of a new future. He promises not only just a return, a restoration, but he speaks about a new order. Jeremiah speaks about a new order. When the city is going to be built and the people who have been despised now uh, will be honored, the visions of economic flourishing that is going to be built on a new foundation and a new covenant that is going to be built on a new knowledge of, of God. What does this mean concretely for African theology as public theology? It means, among other things, that the constructive direction of African theology is precisely what Peter invites us to, to give an account of hope, to provide a healing and a consolation, to point to this new order. How does it look like? If we attend to this seriously, then there are three areas that I see that are um, African theology will focus on in terms of the constructive direction. So three implications again here. The first one is methodology. Methodologically it means that African theology has to take a decisive narrat narrative approach. Because it means that African theology has to develop the portraits of what that new order looks like. It has to point to the seeds of that new order. It has to point to the hope that St. Peter talks about. The role of the theologian is to display this promise of the new covenant concretely and the difference that Christianity makes in the context of Africa. There have been too many theologies that prescribe hope. Africa should be a continent of hope. There should be hope. What we are calling for are concrete theologies that describe what that hope looks like. So the first implication is methodology. But the second implication is the terrible middle within which African theologians find themselves. We live and operate in a terrible middle. 
You see, in the Old Testament prophets, Jeremiah in particular, they occupy this terrible middle, the space between God and the people, unable to turn away from either. Part of Jeremiah's anguish is due to his location in that terrible middle. He sees exactly how God sees and therefore tries to communicate that to his people. But his people, on the other hand, not only disregard him, they actually actively resist him. So he kind of finds himself in this, in the, in, 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 in this middle. Not unlike Jeremiah, African theologians find ourselves in this terrible middle. Suspended one, not only between God and God's people, but, tween, but also between the scholarly productions of the academy and the cries of everyday life on the ground. How to live within that terrible middle without turning away from either? Of course, there are gifts within this location. For example, it provides us with the time, with the space, and other opportunities to think, read, and write, and to interact, to interact with other voices who perhaps are not familiar with the, the concerns, the realities of Africa, as I'm doing right now. On the other hand, it invites us to constantly be grounded within the cries of everyday life in Africa. In that terrible middle, if you like, our role is to call theological insight, is to see like Jeremiah as God sees, and at the same time, see the cries of the people. Bring theological insight to the cries of the people, at the same time, bring the cries of the people to uh, the academy and before God. Being translators and interpreters in that, um, uh, that, 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 that middle. This means there is a type of theology that in a way this calls for, not this abstract theological thinking. We in Africa have to resist being drawn into this philosophical, inconsequential speculation of Western theology. We cannot afford, unlike Western theologians, what is at stake in Africa is so crucial and is so urgent. We cannot keep on theorizing about questions that nobody is asking in Africa. We need to get grounded. It is a shame, and I keep telling my African uh, brothers and sisters doing theology, it's a shame that even 24 years after the genocide in Rwanda, the seminaries do not have courses in theology and the genocide in Rwanda. These are the cries, and yet you find ourselves we are talking, uh, we are discussing Boatman and uh, all these. Um, I don't have anything wrong with Boatman. On the contrary, I like Boatman. But how come these corporation needs, in a way, don't make their way into the theological matrix of theological thinking and education in Africa? Our theological education has to be grounded in what the theologian Jean Marc Ella from Cameroon called shared tree theologies. The theologies of ordinary men and women as they sit under the tree, cultivating, but also wondering, where is the next meal going to come from? We cannot afford the same speculation that is afforded within the Western uh, intellectual uh, settings. Being grounded. That's the second uh, element in terms of uh, the implication for constructive theology in, in, in Africa, being within that terrible middle. The third um, implication means that we have multiple audiences. Because of that middle, we have to constantly keep before us the audiences of our theology. We do not only speak to students in the classroom, but to our colleagues in the academy, many of whom may not have any theological sensibilities. And I have really come to appreciate uh, being at Notre Dame uh, teaching in the theology department, but also in the Croc Institute for International Peace Studies, where we are doing with all scholars, some who are uh, atheists, some who are um, non-believers, uh, Jewish Christian, Ju Ju Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars. They kind of, in a way, different questions they kind of uh, bring. And how to speak theology 
in a way that is not just apologetic, but that kind of in a way shows or is able to trace that presence of God within the movement uh, in different parts of the world. Also, it means that the kind of theology that we do should be accessible to the very people on whose behalf and about whom we are theologizing. It cannot be located and locked up in uh, nice big books that only a few gifted or lucky uh, people can read. This is another reason why narrative is, is so important, so crucial to developing public theology in Africa and the development of portraiture and portraits of how hope looks like. For portraits, in a way, both inform and inspire uh, readers. That is why stories are crucial to any public theology in Africa. By way of conclusion, I can say, to the extent that we are able to do so, we may discover that we are able to move Jesus beyond the secluded world of the academy and the seminaries and beyond the pious sanctuaries of worship to the lived realities and contradictions of everyday life in Africa. Thereby, keeping what Abraham Kuyupat uh, noted about Jesus as the Lord of, uh, of creation and Jesus' lordship that extends to all aspects, such that there is not a single square inch in the whole domain of a human existence over which Christ was sovereign, does not cry mine. Let me end with a story. I came back from two weeks of research in Rwanda, and among other things, I was trying to get a sense of what does hope look like 24 years after the genocide. But one of the stories that captured me was the story of this woman, Maggie Barankisi, who is actually from Burundi, not Rwanda. In The Sacrifice of Africa, an earlier book, I wrote about Maggie Barankisi. For in that book, what I try to do is to provide, in a way, a critique of, theology, uh, of politics in, in Africa. Wondering how come there is all these ongoing realities of war, of poverty, of ethnicity, of tribalism in African politics? What's going on? So I was trying to kind of get a sense of uh, what is going on. So it was, in a way, a critique of politics in Africa, the critical uh, the, uh, direction of, of, of theology. But this book ended with what I call three portraits of where I see Christianity making a difference. And one of the portraits was by this woman, Maggie Barankise, who is from Burundi. In 1993, Maggie witnessed the genocide, in fact, survived the genocide, as 73 people were killed in front of her by members of her own family and members of her own community as a revenge to the death of the president that had been assassinated in a plane crash. So Maggie had adopted uh, five kids at that, 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 that time. And she herself happens to be Tusi. And so, and was hiding a um, majority of Hutu people who had come to take refuge in a bishop's house. So members of her community came, they set the place on fire and uh, brought out everyone and said, we are going to kill them in front of you. So they started killing, killed 73 people in front of her, and they tied her and left, uh, left her there, including uh, one of her closest friends. So when the massacre was over, she's crying, she goes to the church and cries, why, oh God, how long will this go on? Again, the cry of lament. And she had thought that also her children, the ones she had adopted, had perished in the, in the massacre. Fortunately, the kids had survived and we were hiding in the sacristy, so they said, Mama, we are here. And Maggie then discovers within that very moment that the kids are safe and her vocation is to take care of them, but also other children in a new spirit, in a new identity, in a new community of love, saying that love is our true identity because God is love. And so she gathers those children, and was able to gather more children, committed determined to develop a whole new society beyond Hutu and Tusi. 
had us started working with them uh, with incredible innovativeness. She, her one of her taglines was, love has made me a rebel. A rebel to say no to violence, no to war, no to hatred. But also love has made me an inventor. An inventor, therefore, working with the, the children to build a uh, village of Uruhigi, uh, building not only businesses, a garage, a hair salon, but also a theater, a cinema, and incredible as this might sound, also a swimming pool in the middle of her village in Burundi. This is ridiculous. Because there are only two swimming pools in Burundi, as far as I can tell. The first swimming pool is on this beautiful uh, hotel by Lake Tanganyika, Hotel Club du Lac, which is uh, in a way run by a Belgian expatriate. And the second swimming pool is in the middle of this nowhere, Ruhigi, that is built by this woman, Maggie, for her children. Her argument is because love, the explosiveness of God's love, no, has no limits, has no boundaries. And the children in uh, Ruhigi, in uh, Africa, in Burundi, need to enjoy in a way the same, uh, in a way, benefits as children everywhere. Incredible sign of hope. A hospital, one of the best hospitals. Uh, she won the Opus Prize. In incredible. So every time I visited Ruhi, I said, this is a, a real incredible sign of hope. So I wrote about that in The Sacrifice of Africa. That was in 2011. Now in 2015, President Nkurunziza had been fighting, became uh, had become president. He's trying to change the constitution so that he can run again. And uh, he's trying again to tribalize issues, that it is Hutu against Tusi and so forth. And Maggie and her community of Mezo Shalom, they said no. They decided to speak out. They had beat, in the meantime, they had beat also uh, a radio station for advocacy. They decided to speak out. And in response, the government shut down Mezo Shalom, killed some of the children, and Maggie had to flee into exile. She now lives in Rwanda with over 300,000 refugees from Burundi. And yet right there in Rwanda, the outskirts of this refugee camp, she's creating what she's called now an oasis of peace. Working with the refugees, again kind of trying to, uh, to push this new identity of God's love that she uh, has learned as as, as a Christian. In January when I visited, she invited me to visit because she was graduating, the first graduates of the refugee camp in this oasis of peace. 74 students graduating in culinary arts, in sewing, embroidery, and catering, mechanics, painting. It was just amazing to see these young men and women, refugees, all dressed up in gowns. Something didn't fit. They are refugees for God's sake. They're supposed to be in a refugee camp. And Maggie's saying, no. All these children, young men, are walking up to receive their diplomas. But the most touching event for me on this graduation were two things. One, in the evening, in this place, the Oasis of Peace, Maggie hosted dinner for all the graduates and invited guests. Candlelight dinner. In a refugee camp, candlelight dinner. Something doesn't belong there. And in the midst of that candlelight dinner, these graduates standing up in the middle of that and dancing away the night. And Maggie joining with her children dancing. Psalm 23 kept coming back and back to my mind. You have prepared a banquet in the midst of my enemies. You ask me, what does hope look like in Africa? What does public theology look like in Africa? In the midst of Africa's contradictions and pains and challenges, it looks like a Maggie dancing with her refugee children, with her students in exile. And so, what is the role of a theologian then? The role of the theologian is to trace and narrate this movement of God in Africa. 
a movement that is shaped and continues to grow even in the midst of Africa's unyielding social and political challenges. The role of the theologian is to inform and inspire this movement. This, I think, is what Peter has in mind when he says, always be willing to give an account of hope. Thank you. Daniel's offered to uh, entertain a few questions, so please, if you will. <coughs> no questions. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. I'm James Eglinton from Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, thank you for the really thought-provoking address. Could you say something about the role that eschatology plays in the theology of hope? In your yes, uh, very, very briefly. Eschatology sounds very complicated. Eschatology sounds very, <laughs> very, very mysterious. The, the end, the, 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 the end of things. But the way that I understand eschatology here, many people focus on eschatology as the end of the things, and therefore they keep wondering what is going to happen when we die, when the world comes to an end. When will the world come to an end, a particular end, as a kind of uh, terminus, that when things or that's, I think, for many people, that's eschatology gets caught up in those, those kind of discussions. The way I understand it, eschatology really is about the end as telos, the goal. Where, where is everything directed? W what's the toward what um, of things? For me, that's a more a dynamic, vibrant meaning of eschatology the, as, the, as telos, as, as goal, as end. And from that point of view, I see that everything, in a way, is eschatological. Eschatology is not just a province of theology that is just outside there, that is then sits alongside systematic uh, theology, moral theology, and then you have a whole section called eschatological theology or eschatology. Eschatology is theology. Theology is eschatological. Theology always points towards the end, the toward what? What's the goal that all these are directed? What's the goal, for example, like a movement like Maggie that is shaping you know, around Maison Shalom? What is she about? Where is everything directed? Because when she was still in uh, Burundi, people would come and Maison Shalom, this village that she had developed, and people say, oh, we want to go to the, see the hospital, we want to go to see the cinema, the swimming pool. And she said, no, no, no. The cinema. The swimming pool, the hospital, is not the it, it's not the end, it's not the telos, that's not, th that's not the it, that's not where everything is about. Mezo Shalom, you would say, is about a message, a message of God's love. So in this case, in a way, eschatology, as I understand it, is about God's love. God's love in Africa. How does God's love in Africa, in a way, express itself in the midst of all these contradictions? What is that goal? What is that it tell us? And so forth. So I don't spend a lot of time, and I don't want to spend that time wondering, oh, when will the end come? When will be the date? What will be the signs that we know that, okay, now there are 21 days remaining before <laughs> the, 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 the end of the world? And what will happen to me and my body and so forth after I'm, di after I'm dead and so forth? If I believe that the end is directed to God, who cares? It's going to be drawn up in God's movement, God's movement of love that is all-encompassing in a way. So I think that's the kind of eschatology that I find particularly exciting, that it, is inf it infuses, it directs, informs in a way. It's the form, if you like, of all theological thinking. I, I think yes, but I'm speaking out of uh, a particular hesitancy here because I don't know much. I know some uh, about, for example, Jewish theology and Muslim theology, but I don't know much. But this would be, I think, an, an area of conversation between Muslims and Christians and, uh, and, and, and Jews. H how does that language of God's love play out in Islam? And it would provide a very good context for a conversation between, instead of us Christians talking about 
what Jews and Muslims be believe about God's love. But that said, I think that is the message that underlies Islam and Judaism at the same time. Uh, which we, w w what means in the way that if we try to focus on this God's love in a way that kind of infuses and directs everything and toward what everything is drawn, we may find actually that we have much more in common than what divides us. If we take this as the, the tiros, as the goal in a way, we find that actually Hutu and Tusi, black and white, Africans and Americans, that we are all drawn in a way in this movement. There is something all encompassing, if you like, about this, this movement. I don't want to be what theologians or philosophers call essentialist in our way. In other words, reducing everything about Christianity to one element. But there is something about God's love uh, that sends Christ to the cross. That there's something that if we don't get that right, there is something that we have missed about the message of Christianity. But if we get it right, I think we come to the same conclusion as Ibrahim Koyupa that everything in a way cries out, it's mine. God is, God's love is sovereign. And, 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 but the way that God's love in a way is manifested, especially in suffering, that, that is the mystery of Christian faith. That is not manifested in thunderous uh, expression of power, but in the cross. That is what makes Christianity unique and humble, but at the same time radical and revolutionary, if, if, if you like. But also in a way that, that drives that commitment to nonviolence, to, to peace uh, at the heart of Christianity. So I think there would be a lot that we can talk about about God's love. But th the, the more I think about it, the more I feel drawn to, to, to have a conversation about what that might mean uh, for non-Christian uh, peoples. What can you what so much what, what can you add on God's love? That's that's I it, I think. That which nothing more. Huh? Yeah, no, <laughs> no, nothing more. Well, uh, please again thank our our dear friends. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you.